Welcome to your video on chapter 14. <clears throat> chapter 14 is all about oxidation and reduction. Um, basically, this is your lesson on electrochemistry. And electrochemistry is a branch of chemistry that many people find very confusing. However, it is integral to our daily lives. So every battery that you come across, that's an electrochemical reaction happening. So the batteries in your cell phones, the batteries in your laptops, anything around you that requires a battery, that's electrochemistry at work. So let's get into it. So oxidation and reduction. So we've sort of talked about this a little bit in previous chapters, very, very briefly, but we haven't gotten into any details about it. But oxidation, very simply, is loss of electrons. And one way to, to think about it is... Um, the, the way I learned about oxidation and reduction and reduction being gain of electrons is an acronym that is OIL RIG. So if I say O I L R I G, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Oxidation is losing electrons, reduction is gaining electrons. The other one that I've heard is Leo. The lion goes grr. And that stands for loss of electrons is oxidation, gain electrons, reduction. Okay? But what I would like you all to focus on in this chapter in terms of determining oxidation and reduction is that with oxidation, the oxidation number. goes up. Okay. And then reduction, the oxidation number goes down. And then in my mind, reduction is the easier one to find because when you reduce something, you make it smaller, right? The simple like definition of to reduce something is to make it smaller. So if you're talking about something that has an oxidation number that goes from a plus 3 to a plus 2, that's an oxidation number that has gotten smaller. And so a reduction has happened. Okay. Now oxidation and reduction are a paired thing. You can't have a reduction without an oxidation, and that's very important. So if you think that you have, depending on the oxidation numbers that you've written, if you think that you have a an oxidation, but you don't see a reduction, then you may need to recheck your work, okay? So oxidation numbers have rules, okay? This is very important. This is a set of rules, okay? Very much like when we did Lewis structures, we had rules for drawing Lewis structures. Oxidation numbers, assigning oxida oxidation numbers, have rules also. Now, a very important thing is that oxidation numbers are not the same as charge. Oops. Do not equal charge. Okay, they're not the same thing. Now, quite often, the oxidation number is the same thing as would be the normal charge of a particular element. Okay, and you see in this, this box over on the right, number four, most of the, uh, like, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, oxygen, they all have the same oxidation numbers that they would normally have as ions, okay? But you're, we're going to find that quite often elements outside of those groups um, will have oxidation numbers that are different from their charges, Okay, so oxidation number is not the same as charge, although they are often the same number. Okay, it's very important to realize that they're similar, but not the same. Okay, so let's take a look at, at assigning oxidation numbers. Okay, so if you haven't um, done this part, uh, written these parts down, so any element in their uh, elemental form in any elemental form, sorry, <laughs> I mean, my reading is, is great right now. Any elemental form oxidation number is zero. That's things like solid metals. 
or the diatomic molecules. Dia diatomic molecules. Okay, if you remember those, it was it was I brought clay from our new house, right? And these are all I2, Br2, Cl2, F2O2, and <laughs> 2H2. Boy. Right, remember all those? Those are all included in that elemental form thing. Also, things like solid carbon, right? That's what's in your pencil leads, right? Graphite is solid carbon. So anything in its, in its naturally occurring state has an oxidation number of zero, right? Monatomic ions, so things like Na+, or Cl-, or magnesium-2+ they will have the same oxidation number as the charge of the ion, okay? So polyatomic ions, the oxidation numbers must add up to the overall charge. Zero for neutral compounds, and we'll sort of get into that as we go. All right? Now, let's, before I go away from this, atomics, atomic atoms that have, or, <laughs> sorry. So these are the same always. Okay, so oxygen is always a minus two um, oxidation state. Fluorine is always a minus one. Chlorine, bromine, iodine, always minus one. Hydrogen is usually a plus one unless it's bonded to a metal. Okay, the others that are always the same are the group one metals. Okay, so things like sodium, lithium, potassium, okay, those are always oxidation states of plus one. All right, so, and these, these rules are all outlined in your textbook as well. So I hope, hope you have taken a look at those at this point and um, you're aware of some of the things that I'm saying. All right, so let's go through some practice. So let's identify the oxidation numbers of each element in these reactions. And we're gonna underline oxidized elements and circle reduced elements. So in order to figure out what is oxidized and what's reduced, we need to assign oxidation numbers. Okay, there's no other way to tell what is oxidized and what's reduced unless we assign oxidation numbers. Now, the oxidation numbers Go for each atom. Ox numbers. Go for each atom. And that's very important. Okay. So let's take a look at, at what we have in our, our uh, line A here. And of course, let's, we always know this, the little question mark always means that there should be an arrow there. A little translation issue with the the programming so silver solid so solid metals with the exception of mercury all metals are solid in their natural states so solid silver is going to have an oxidation number of zero okay and then our next one is f2 that's one of our naturally occurring polyatomics or diatomics excuse me naturally occurring diatomics, so it's gonna also have an oxidation state of zero. Okay, now let's look at our products. So no longer in our naturally occurring state, we have silver fluoride, solid. So fluoride is one of those ones, most of the halogens will always be minus ones, right? And then if I have a neutral compound, everything has to come out to be zero. So if I have a minus one for the fluorine, that means that the silver has to be a plus one. Okay, now let's think about it. Reduction means to reduce, right? So the oxidation number is going to go down, right? So if my oxidation number goes down, things are reduced. So if fluorine goes from a zero to a minus one, 
silver goes from a zero to a plus one. That one went up, okay? So fluorine has been reduced. And silver went, that oxidation number went up. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna abbreviate because I'm lacking space, okay? So when the oxidation number goes up, things are oxidized. When things go, when oxidation number goes down, things are reduced, okay? And like I said before, use the word reduced. Things get smaller when they're reduced, okay? So it's often easiest to identify what's reduced first, then identify what's been oxidized, okay? But I'm gonna take this out because it says to circle the reduced elements. So let's circle the fluorine because the fluorine has been reduced. And then the oxidized element was the silver. We said to underline, sorry. Underline the oxidized. All right. So let's assign oxidation states for line B. Okay. So sulfur is a sort of less known thing, but if you've ever been to a volcano or if you ever will go to a volcano or if you've ever seen a documentary about volcanoes you know that sulfur exists as a solid in nature so sulfur is going to be a zero all right the next one in line is o2 oxygen is one of our naturally occurring diatomics so that also has a zero and each atom of oxygen has a zero okay now let's take a look at our sulfite, our sulfur trioxygen, trioxide, excuse me. Okay. So each oxygen is a minus two. So minus two, minus two, minus two. Okay, because I have three of them. Right? So in order for this whole molecule to be a zero, I need it all to, to balance out to zero. That means that sulfur has to be a plus six. Okay, so let's let's take a look. So each oxygen went from a zero to a minus two, and each sulfur went from a zero to a plus six. Those are the things that are changing, right? So if my oxidation number went down, we're reduced. And if my oxidation number went up, then I'm oxidized. Okay, so let's take that uh, little bit of nomen uh, notation out and we will circle the reduced elements and that would be the oxygen and underline the oxidized elements, which is the sulfur. All right, so let's take a look at line C. All right, the easiest one to pick out is that O2 so O2, each atom of oxygen is at a zero because it's naturally occurring diatomic, okay? Then let's take a look at the CH4. So the CH4, when hydrogen is bonded to a non-metal, each hydrogen is a plus one, and I have four of them, okay? So then in order for that whole molecule to have a total of zero, that means that my carbon has to have an oxidation number of minus four. All right, now let's look at the product side. So in CO2, each oxygen is a minus two, and I have two of them, so minus two, minus two. So in order for that whole thing to balance out, then the carbon has to be a plus four. Now let's look at the water. So water bonded to hydrogen. Water is a minus two. And then in order for things to balance out properly, hydrogen bonded to a non-metal is a plus one, and I have two of them. Plus one, plus one. All right, so let's think, let's take a look at, at how things have worked. So when we decide what is oxidized and what's reduced, we have to pay attention to the oxidation state of each atom. So my carbon 
has gone from a minus 4 to a plus 4. Now, has that number gone up or gone down? And in fact, that number has gone up, right? Minus 4 to plus 4 means that that number has increased. So that's going to be an oxidation. Right now, my oxygen went from a 0 to a minus 2. So that number has gone down. So it's the reduction. Okay. Now if we look at the hydrogens, the hydrogens went from a plus one to a plus one. So nothing has changed for those hydrogens. <coughs> okay. All right, so we're going to circle the reduced elements. That would be the oxygen. We're going to underline the oxidized elements and that's the carbon. All right. So what is the oxidation number of the phosphorus in this ion? So it's a PO4, 3 minus. Right. Now the, oxid the sum of the oxidation numbers has to equal the charge of an ion. Okay, so oxygen, when it's in a compound, is a minus 2. And then I have four of them. So I've got minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. Right? And in order for this thing to equal minus 3, then I need my phosphorus to be a plus six. Nope, sorry, that's incorrect, plus five. Sorry, as soon as I wrote that, I realized that it was incorrect. Okay, so minus two times four is a minus eight. Minus eight plus five equals minus three. Let's try this one. So what is the oxidation number of carbon in this compound? So this is sodium bicarbonate. So NaHCO3. Right, so group one metals like sodium are always plus ones. Hydrogen, when it's bonded to nonmetals, is a plus one. Oxygen, when it's in a compound, is a minus 2, but I have 3 of them. So that gives me a minus 6. So the other two, uh, the sodium and the hydrogen, each give me a plus 2. So that means that this carbon needs to be a plus 4. So my total of the pluses is 6, and my total of the minuses is also 6. So I get a total of 0 for a neutral compound. What is the oxidation number of potassium iodate? KiO4. All right. Potassium is a group 1 metal, so they always have an oxidation state of plus 1. Each oxygen is a minus 2, and I have 4 of them. Minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. So that gives me a total of minus 8. And this whole thing has to come out to be 0. So minus 8 plus 1 means that that iodine needs to be a plus 7. Okay. Now this is an excellent example of where charge is different than oxidation state. Because usually, iodine makes a 1 minus ion, its charge would be 1 minus. But in this case, its oxidation state is different from its charge. What species is oxidized in this reaction? Okay, so we want to assign oxidation numbers. Okay, that's the only way we're going to be able to tell. 
So magnesium is a metal and it's a solid. Metal solids, naturally occurring state for metals. So magnesium has an oxidation state of zero. Cl2 gas, that's one of our naturally occurring diatomics. So that also gets a zero. Now let's look at our product. So this should have an arrow here, sorry. <laughs> so at our product, so the chlorine, the halogens usually have minus one oxidation states and we have two chlorines. So minus one, minus one. And then the magnesium needs to balance that out. So we get a zero for our total. So that means the magnesium has to be a plus two. Right, so which oxidation state went down? That would be the chlorine. And the oxidation number that went up is the magnesium. So magnesium is oxidized. Which species is oxidized in this reaction? Again, Sign oxidation numbers. Okay, so group one metals like sodium, starting left to right, group one metals are always plus ones. Hydrogen, when it's bonded to a nonmetal, is also a plus one. So that means that our oxygen, which is always minus two, that works out just fine. Okay, our hydrogen is a plus one. Our chlorine is a minus one because it's a halogen. Sodium is a plus one. Chlorine is a minus one. Hydrogen is a plus one and I have two of them. And then oxygen is minus two. So does anything change? Let's take a look. The sodium goes from a plus one to a plus one left to right. There should be an arrow here also. Sorry about that. Um, plus one to a plus one. Oxygen goes from a minus two to a minus two. Hydrogen plus one to plus one. So nothing has changed. All right, so nothing is oxidized. Now, just as a reminder, as we go through these problems, I very much encourage you to pause when we get to a new question, hit the pause button on the YouTube video so that you can work out the problem yourself and then come back and see how you did. Okay. So which of the following is never a redox reaction? All right. So I, what I've done is I've, I've given an example of a precipitation reaction here. Precipitation reaction, okay? Just to demonstrate what happens. So with any type of these reactions, and you could write yourself a, an example of a combustion reaction or a synthesis reaction or a single displacement, okay? And what you'll find is if you assign oxidation numbers for your reaction, now that you have that skill, you can determine whether a certain type of reaction is a redox reaction. Redox standing for reduction oxidation, okay? So let's take a look at this precipitation reaction that we've written, and we'll find that the sodium has gone from a plus one to a plus one, left to right. Our chlorine has gone from a minus one to a minus one, so no change there. Our lead, went from a plus two to a plus two. And our nitrate with the nitrogen and oxygen also has not changed. So no change means no redox. Okay, so in this particular question, which of the following is never a redox reaction? We could go through the other examples, but you'll find that they are all redox reactions except for precipitation.
when a metal reacts with oxygen, what happens? So I've written a reaction here of magnesium metal reacting with oxygen. And I've balanced it. And what we want to do is we want to assign oxidation states. Okay, so magnesium metal, metal solid, always has an oxidation number of zero. O2 is a naturally occurring diatomic, so it gets a zero. Then if I look in my product side, the oxidation should have a, or excuse me, the oxidation, the oxygen should have a minus two. And then in order to balance things out, my magnesium should also, should be a plus two. Okay, so which, which one has had the oxidation number reduced? Which one num has the oxidation number go down? That would be the oxygen. Which one has the oxidation number go up? That would be the magnesium. Okay, so electrons are transferred from the O2 to the metal, so oxidation is loss. So if the oxygen were oxidized, then that would be true. The liquid is transformed. Liquid is formed? No, we haven't formed any liquids. Double displacement reaction has occurred? No, this is a synthesis reaction. The metal has been oxidized? That is the true statement. So the magnesium has gone from an oxidation state of zero to a plus two, that means that it has been oxidized. So when hydrocarbon is completely combusted in excess of oxygen, what products form? Now, regardless of this being a chapter about oxidation and reduction, this should be one that comes right to mind that when you combust a hydrocarbon, you get two products, and that would be carbon dioxide gas and H2O gas. In other words, steam. So we want to write a balanced chemical equation for the combustion of liquid hexane, C6H14. Use whole number coefficients reduced to the lowest terms. So what is the coefficient of O2? So let's write out our reaction and then balance it. So we have C6, oh, I'll give, give myself a little bit more room here, C6H14. And we're going to combust it. That means that we're going to react it with oxygen. That's the definition of a combustion reaction. Remember that, please. <clears throat> and when we combust a hydrocarbon, so something that is hydrogens and carbons only, when we combust a hydrocarbon, we get carbon dioxide and water. So let's go through and balance this. So I'm going to I'm going to balance the oxygen last because that's a useful tactic whenever you have something sitting all by itself. So I like to go left to right. So I have, um, and remember in class I did these lists. So let's do a list. So I have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So on the left I have 6, 14, and 2. And on the right, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, I have 1, 2, and three. Okay, so I find it convenient to go left to right, so I'm just going to start with the carbons and balance them first. All right, so I have six on the left, one on the right, so I'm going to put a six here. That gives me now six carbons and 12, 13 oxygens. Okay, so the next easiest one is the hydrogens. I have 14 on the left, two on the right, so if I put a seven here, then that gives me 14 hydrogens and 12 plus seven, that makes 19 oxygens. Okay, so the last thing to balance is the oxygens and I'm gonna use a nice little trick. 
because if I have O2 and I write a fraction, 19 over 2, then that gives me the correct number of oxygens, but I can't leave it that way. So I'm going to multiply the whole thing by 2, and that will give me, and I'm going to erase a few things here real quick, so that I can put in the correct coefficients after I've multiplied. So when I multiply everything, I'll get 2, 19, 12, and 14. And normally I would show this in a much more uh, expanded form, um, but let's double check that we have done this correctly. So on the left, I now have 12 carbons, I now have 28 hydrogens, and I now have 38 oxygens. All right, and don't freak out because they're large numbers, <laughs> okay? So on the right, now I have 12 carbons. I have 24 oxygens with the CO2, and then another 14 with my um, H2O. So that's going to give me 38. And then my hydrogens, I have 2 times 14 is 28. Okay, and I can't reduce those coefficients any lower because there's no common multiple between all of them. Now, metal displacement reactions. So these are redox reactions. So these should be arrows. Okay. So on one hand, we have an oxidation of zinc to zinc 2 plus, And on the other hand, we have a reduction of copper 2 plus to copper solid. And that's actually what's happening in this um, image is that this black stuff is the copper solid, okay? And that solution is a bunch of ions, okay? So I'll have copper ions and zinc ions, okay? So when I put a piece of solid zinc in a solution of, for example, copper sulfate, I will have a spontaneous reaction where I get copper solid built up on the surface of the zinc. Okay. So how that works is a thing called the activity series, okay? And the activity series allows us to determine spontaneous reactions. Okay, will a reaction happen all by itself, all right? And in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. The way to tell is if solid metal is higher on the table than the ion it's with. Okay, so in the case of solid iron with nickel ions, find the metal on the table, that's the iron, and is it higher on the table than the ion, that would be the nickel two plus, then yes. Okay, and that's sort of what this red and green crisscross thing is showing. Right. So let's do a little bit of practice. Okay. So based on these on the activity series, which of these metals will react with aqueous nickel chloride, nickel 2 chloride? So I would have a formula that looks like this. 
and it's aqueous, so nickel 2 plus plus Cl minus. So this is what we're looking for. All right, so let's find our nickel 2 plus on the table. And it's sitting right there. So which of these metals will react? Anything that's higher on the table. So the metals that are higher on the table, okay? Solid metals, so barium. Barium's higher up, so yes. Chromium, let's find chromium. Chromium is higher up, so yes. Tin, S-N, where is it? Tin is right here, just below so no, if the, if the metal solid is below the ion, then it will not react. Copper, copper's right here, it's lower down, so no. How about aluminum? Aluminum is sitting right here, so it's higher up, so yes. And how about gold? Gold is down here, very, very bottom of the table, so no. Right? But the, the moral of the story here is that when you want to decide whether a reaction will happen, find the ion, and if the metal is higher on the table, the reaction will happen. All right, let's complete each metal displacement reaction. If no reaction occurs, write no reaction. So let's decide first whether a reaction will happen before we bother trying to put things together, okay? So, but first of all, we're going to do, if a reaction happens, we're going to do a single displacement reaction, right? But let's decide first if something will happen. So cobalt bromide, we're gonna be looking for cobalt ion. And in part B here, we're going to look for zinc ion. And in part C, we're going to look for chromium ion. Okay? And then these are the solids, metal solids. So remember, if the solid is higher up on the table than the ion, a reaction will happen. So in our first one, we find cobalt ion. It's sitting right here. And if the metal is higher on the table, then a reaction will happen, right? So zinc will react with cobalt ions. So we're gonna do a double displacement. So we end up with zinc with the bromine plus cobalt ions. And zinc is a two plus, so bromine has to have a two, okay? So let's look at B. So we're looking for zinc ions. And is cobalt higher up on the table? And the fact is no, so no reaction. All right, and let's look at C. So chromium ions. So chromium with aluminum, and aluminum metal is higher on the table, so a reaction will happen. So aluminum makes a three plus ion, so I'm gonna have aluminum nitrate, that's a three, plus chromium three plus ions. And let's see if we were right. Okay. Reactions of metals with acid and water. So we've already been through this in the previous chapter, that when we have a metal 
reacting with an acid, we get a hydrogen gas, okay? That part has not changed. What's different now is that we are paying attention to the fact that this is a redox reaction. Okay, so if we go through this, we will find that this nitrate ion is the same on both sides, and the nitrate ion will not change oxidation state. So it's basically a spectator. So we're going to leave it out of our equation. Right? So based on the activity series, which of these metals will react with hydrochloric acid? So basically, we're looking for things that will react with H plus ions. Okay? Because that's what hydrochloric acid makes. In our previous chapter with acids and bases, we talked about how hydrochloric acid comes apart into H plus ions. So we're looking to see which of these metals is higher up on the table than hydrogen ions, right? So let's find our hydrogen ions, and they are sitting right down here at that level. So let's see about zinc, right? Zinc is higher up, so it will react. Aluminum is higher up, so it will react. Lead. Let's find lead. Lead is just barely higher up, so it will react. Copper is just below, so it will not. Barium, close to the top of the table, definitely going to react. And gold, way down at the bottom, will not react. All right? Incidentally, this group of elements down here at the very bottom of the table, copper, silver, platinum, and gold, are often referred to as the noble metals, right? Mostly because they don't react with many things, and the activity series is why. So this is why gold does not tarnish, and silver will tarnish, but it won't react with many things. Platinum is, is almost impervious as well. Copper holds up really well under time as well. So these metals don't react with much because of their place on the activity series. So that's why we make things like jewelry and precious things out of these, these fancy metals. Not only because they, they're pretty, because they hold up under time. They don't react with much. They don't oxidize. Right, so reaction of metals with acid and water. Okay, all of our alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, remember the video that I showed you all in class at the beginning of the semester? They react very badly with water. They also react badly with steam and acid. Now the earth metals, magnesium, calcium, barium, that, that second column, the alkali earth metals, they don't react so much with liquid water, but they do react badly with steam and with acid. Most of the transition metals will react with acid. And then our precious metals, like I was just talking about, those noble metals, don't really react with much at all. So let's identify the reactant that will react with solid nickel. Okay, so in this case, we want to pay attention to the ions, okay? So we're looking at cal or potassium ion, zinc ion, silver ion, barium ion, chromium ion, okay? So solid nickel is sitting right here. So which ions are lower down on the table? So potassium... Let's find potassium right at the top, okay? Potassium ion is a, above the metal. In order for reaction to happen, the metal has to be higher. So potassium will not work. Zinc, higher up, will not work. Silver, 
when the ion is lower on the table than the metal, that's a possibility. Barium, the ion is higher, so no. And chromium, the ion is higher, so no. So our answer is silver nitrate will react with solid nickel. But remember, if the solid metal is higher on the table than the ion, reaction will happen. So the trick is to identify the ion, right? And we're talking about the positive ions. We want to know about the metal ions. We don't care about the nitrates. The nitrate was the same in every um, uh, multiple choice, all nitrate ions, okay? So we're concerned with the metal ions. And if the metal ion is lower on the table than the solid metal, then we will have a reaction. Which of the following metals will react with water? All right, and this is coming back to our, uh, let's come back to our table up here. All right, so things that will react with water are the alkali metals. So let's come back down to our question. None of these are alkali metals. Perhaps we're talking about steam. Sort of funky wording on the question, but the only one that will react with steam is a group two metal, an alkali earth metal, and that would be magnesium. Perhaps a typo on that. <laughs> Have to fix that for next semester. So how many of these metals will react with HNO2? Recognize that that, buddy, is an acid. So we're looking for which things are higher on the table than H+. So our H+, is sitting right here. All right, so zinc. Higher up. Barium. Higher up. Gold, it's lower down, cobalt is higher up, and copper is just below, so no. So we'll have three of these metals reacting with nitrous acid. So what gas is formed when magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid? And this is very simple. When metal reacts with acid, we get hydrogen gas. It's one of the standard reaction types. Metal plus acid makes hydrogen gas. Now, half reactions. So an equation that shows only the reduction or oxidation of a reaction. So in gray there, we have a complete, uh, a full net ionic reaction. Okay. And if we assign oxidation numbers, we can put down a zero, a plus two, a plus two, and a zero. So the copper has gone down and the zinc has gone up. Right? So if I pull just those parts out and just pull the oxidation out, I end up with the oxidation half reaction. And if I pull just the, the reduction part out, I get the reduction half reaction. Okay? And when I put those two equations together, if I combine them, so we sort of have like an addition sign, put those two reactions together, 
things that are exactly the same on both sides, I cancel out, much like we did with when we were doing complete and net ionic equations. Remember those? So my two electrons are the same on both sides, so I cancel those out. Okay. So let's do a little practice with this. It's the best way to go about this. All right. Now, I've written some, some guidelines here on how to tackle this type of, of problem. So the first step is to assign oxidation numbers. So let's go ahead and, and do that. You've, you've had a bit of practice with that already. So let's go ahead and assign oxidation numbers. So each chlorine is a minus one, and I have two of them. So that means that in order for that molecule to be neutral, my, my tin has to be a plus two, All right? And then we have iron solid, so solid iron, solid metals always get a zero. And then on my product side, I have a minus two, excuse me, each chlorine is a minus one, and I have two of them. So that means that my iron has to be a plus two. And then my tin, naturally occurring solid metal, is a zero, okay? So if I look, my chlorine is a spectator. So the chlorine has not changed at all, right? So I'm gonna leave the chlorine out of anything. I'm not even gonna bother putting it in my equations, right? But my reduction, so my tin has gone from a plus two to a zero, right? So I'm gonna pull that right out. So this we've so this is step two. We've determined what's oxidized and reduced, and we're gonna pull that right out of the equation. So I'm gonna pull out that tin two plus, which is what it would be without the chlorine, becomes tin solid. Okay? And I find it helpful, you don't have to do this, but I find it helpful to keep my oxidation numbers in there just so that I can have them to look at. And then my iron went from a zero to a plus two. So I'm gonna pull that piece out and say iron solid becomes iron two plus because that's what it would be without the chlorines, okay? So now step three says leave out the spectators. Those are the things that don't change oxidation state. That would be the chlorines, okay? Now step four says to add electrons to the side with a more positive oxidation state. Now if I went, let's look at our oxidation half reaction. So if I went from a zero to a two, that's a change of two. That means two electrons have moved. Okay, the difference between zero and plus two is two. That means that two electrons have moved. So I'm gonna put those electrons on the side with the more positive oxidation state. That means that I'm gonna put them on the right next to the iron two plus. Okay, in my reduction half reaction with the tin, <clears throat> We go from a plus two to a zero. Again, we have a change of two. That means that two electrons have moved. Okay, and I'm gonna put them on the side with the more positive oxidation state. So two electrons go on the left. Okay, so if you're ever in doubt on how this works, assign oxidation states oxidation numbers, and then pull just those pieces out. Literally just pull them, plunk them right out of the equation. Leave the spectators behind. And then add electrons to the side with a more positive oxidation number. And the electrons are always equal to the change in the oxidation states. Right. Let's do a little practice there. So that's our uh, answer to the previous question. So this is a bit of a sort of odd question, but let's think about this. So what happens when we put metals 
with acids, the metal gets dissolved and we generate hydrogen gas. Okay, so most of the time cooking utensils, pots and pans, these days are made out of Teflon materials and all kinds of things that protect the metals. But talking about cast iron pans, there's no protection on there. So what happens if you put acid with bare iron? You will dissolve your iron. Okay, a little bit flammable gases, but in very small quantities. Okay, but none of these other things really mean anything. The iron will not melt at a lower temperature. The acid will not cause the food to cook too quickly. None of those things change how heat is transferred, but you may possibly dissolve some of the iron. Okay. So back to our picking out oxidation half reactions. So nickel reacting with nitric acid. So let's take a look at that reaction. So nickel solid plus HCl. When metals react with acids, we get H2 gas and a salt. And that's, uh, that should be NiCl2. And we do a little balancing. We put a two here and everything's hunky-dory. So let's in order to understand what side, what thing has oxidized and what things reduced, we have to assign oxidation numbers. Assign oxidation numbers. Okay, so solid metal gets a zero. Hydrogen gas on the right here gets a zero. Chlorine is minus one, hydrogen is plus one. On the right, Chlorine is still minus one, but I have two of them. So that means that nickel has to be a plus two. Right? So which, which thing has had their oxidation number go down? So hydrogen went from a plus one to a zero. So it's reduced. And then nickel went from a zero to a plus two. So oxidation. So let's pull the nickel out of that reaction. So nickel solid at a zero going to nickel two plus. So I'm leaving the chlorine out. The chlorine is the one thing that hasn't changed. So that's a spectator, right? So the difference between zero and two is two. So that's two electrons have moved. And I'm gonna put them on the side that has the more positive oxidation state. Okay, so these should all have arrows right here. <laughs> Now comes the fun part. So talking about batteries, right? So what's shown in this picture doesn't really look like much of a battery, but it generates electricity. Now batteries by themselves are spontaneous chemical reactions waiting to happen. And as soon as you connect something to the two ends of your battery, Electrons can start flowing through that machinery and allowing the electrochemical reaction inside to take place, okay? But until you connect those two ends, nothing happens because the electrons can't flow, okay? So the way batteries work, and especially the pictures that we're showing you of these, these are called galvanic cells. Galvanic or voltaic cells. Okay, and 
By convention, we always put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. Okay? And anode is always the oxidation side and cathode is always the reduction side. Okay? And the way you can remember that is that anode and oxidation start with vowels and cathode and reduction start with consonants consonants okay the other way that I figured it out um, before I recognized that part of things is that the word cathode has a positive sign on it, and the cathode is also the positive electrode. Okay, the other way to think about it is, um, my other favorite, is the red cat. Okay, so, but the important thing is that the anode is on the left, and the cathode is on the right. Okay, in, in any image of an electrochemical cell like this, anode is on the left, cathode is on the right. Oxidation on the left, reduction on the right. Okay, and electrons will always flow from the anode to the cathode. They always go in this direction, All right? So now what's actually happening inside of our beakers is that on the left, we have one half reaction. And on the right, we have the other half reaction. In case you were wondering why we've been talking about splitting reactions in half this whole time, this is why, because we are physically separating the two reactions, okay, in order to make something that generates electricity, okay? So in this example, on the left, we have a piece of zinc in zinc ions. So down here in the solution, we have zinc 2 plus ions, because it's zinc sulfate. And on the right, we have copper, solid copper, in copper ions, okay? So as the reaction happens, we have zinc solid becoming zinc two plus ions, okay? So quite literally, this solid zinc on the left-hand side, the solid zinc is becoming ions in the solution. So the anode side actually loses mass, okay, because that solid material is breaking down and becoming ions in solution, okay? Every time some electrons go through that wire, some of that zinc is oxidized from solid to ions, right? So on the right-hand side, however, as electrons come in, we take a look at that reduction half reaction, we have copper ions becoming copper solid, right? So as electrons flow in, those copper two ions become copper solid. So the cathode side gains in mass. Okay, we're talking about the electrodes losing mass or gaining mass, those pieces of metal, okay? So, and this will continue spontaneously until there's no more zinc, no more solid zinc electrode left over. And this is just like what happens in batteries of your cell phones or your laptops or, or your car, for example, is that you have an anode side and a cathode side. And eventually, the battery wears out because the anode side has been used up. 
And then in rechargeable batteries, like in your cell phones and your laptops and your car, if you apply some sort of external voltage, like you plug it into your charger, you can force the reaction in the opposite direction. So your cathode loses mass and you rebuild your anode. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. So in this electrochemical cell, the electrons will flow from the zinc electrode to the copper electrode based on this, which is true. So for flowing from the zinc to the copper, so remember that the left-hand side is zinc solid being oxidized to zinc two plus. So zinc is becoming ions. And on the right-hand side, we have copper 2 plus becoming copper solid is a reduction. So oxidation on the left, reduction on the right. So we have copper ions becoming copper solid. So let's take a look at our, our uh, answers here. So copper electrode will lose mass. That's not true. The ions in the salt bridge will travel to the right, the anions to the right, and the cations to the left. Well, we didn't really talk about that. Let's come back and talk about that really quick. So let's think about this. So on the, looking at the left-hand beaker, okay? The left-hand beaker is building positive charge. Okay, I'm getting more positive ions in the solution. So in order to keep the charge balanced, I need negative ions to come in. So that's the, the point of this salt bridge, is that I'll have negative ions flowing out of the salt bridge. On the right-hand side, I'm building negative charge. Right? Because my positive ions are going away. Right? So in order for to keep a charge balanced, if I'm making more negative charge, I need my sodium ions to come in. Okay? So the salt bridge is there to maintain balance. Right? Because if my on the left, if my zinc is becoming zinc plus, I've got more pluses in there. So in order to keep the balance, I need to add more minuses. That's where the nitrate ion comes in, that negatively charged nitrate ion. On the right, as I lose negative charge because my copper 2 plus is going away, it's becoming copper solid, I'm getting more negative charge, so I need to add more positive in there with the sodium plus ions. So let's take a look at our answers again. So now that we've addressed that. so. The anions in the salt bridge will travel to the right and the cations to the left. Let's see, let's take a look at our example. So in our example, our negative ions, our anions travel to the left and our positives to the right. So no. The concentration of zinc ions will increase take a look. So on our left hand side, the zinc ion, the zinc solid becomes zinc ions. So as this process goes, then we get more zinc ions. So that is a good answer. And the color of the copper sulfate solution will get darker blue. Well, the color is a result of the copper ions. So on the right, I'm losing copper ions to become copper solid. So if it were becoming darker blue, I'm giving more copper ions. So I've got less copper ions. So it will not become darker blue. All right, balance each of the following redox reactions. Make sure that both the number of atoms and the total charge balance. Okay. Now, because this takes up a little bit of space, I've added an extra page here, and we can work on these problems together. So the first step in dealing with redox equations is to, wait, 
make sure I copied that correctly. I didn't. Yes, I did. Okay, sorry. Don't get seasick. Um, is to assign oxidation states. Okay, so solid aluminum, solid metal gets a zero. Br2, that's one of our naturally occurring diatomics, so that's a zero. Monatomic ions get a plus three. Well, they, they get their charge, so this one gets a plus three. And this one gets its charge, so a minus one. Okay, so let's take a look. The aluminum goes from a zero to a plus three. So that's an oxidation. And bromine goes from a zero to a minus one. Its oxidation state went down. So it's a reduction. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop those pieces out, the oxidation piece and the reduction piece. I'm going to drop them straight down vertically. Okay, and I find this is often a useful way to look at half reactions. And I'm going to keep that arrow in the same place. Okay, and I also find that it's useful to keep my oxidation numbers in there. Okay. So there's my oxidation half reaction. And then I'm going to drop my reduction reaction straight down the same way. All right, and I like to keep those oxidation numbers in there. Okay, so now I want to make sure that each half reaction is balanced before I do anything else. Okay. And this is my, the bottom one is my reduction, okay? So in my top reaction, my oxidation half reaction, I have one aluminum on the left, one aluminum on the right. Great, okay? On my bottom half reaction, I have two bromines on the left, and two, uh, one bromine on the right. So I need to add a two, okay? So now let's take a look at, I need to add electrons to finish my half reactions, okay? So on my oxidation half reaction, I have a change of three. It goes from a zero to a three. So that means three electrons have moved, okay? And I'm gonna put them on the side with the more positive oxidation state. That's the right-hand side, because a zero or a plus three, plus three wins. So I'm gonna put three electrons on the right. Okay. Now let's take a look at our reduction half reaction. So remember that the oxidation state counts for each atom. Okay, so on the left, I have Br2. So that means that I have two bromine atoms, both with a zero. So I've got two zeros on the left. On the right, because I've balanced things, now I have two Br minuses. Each one of them is a minus one. Okay, so I've got a change of two, because each atom goes from a zero to a minus one. And then I've got two atoms, both of them going from a zero to a minus one. That means two electrons. Okay, and I'm gonna put them on the side with the more positive oxidation state. If I have to choose between zero and minus one, I'm gonna go with zero as more positive. So I say a two E. Okay, so now I've added my electrons. Now I need to cancel the electrons. which means they need to be the same. Okay, so I'm gonna, just for sake of space here, we're gonna do this. Okay, so what I need to do is multiply my equations in order to get the same number of electrons in both reactions, okay? So my common multiple is six. 
right? So I'm going to multiply my top equation, the whole thing, by 2, and my bottom equation by 3, okay? I'm almost out of space. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite these equations just below here in blue so you can see what they look like, and then I'm going to show you how to cancel things out. So 2 AL solid makes 2 AL3 plus plus 6 electrons. And then my second equation will give me 6 electrons plus 3 BR2s and 6 BR minuses. Okay. And then I'm going to add them together. Things that are the same on opposite sides, just like when we did net ionic equations. Things that are the same on opposite sides, I can cancel out. And that would be my electrons. I need my electrons to disappear. Okay, and then my final answer will be whatever's left. So I should end up with two aluminum solid plus three Br. I don't know why I have, <laughs> that shouldn't be a superscript, Br2, there we go. Two Al3 plus plus six Br minuses. And it should be a balanced equation. And if I look, I've got two aluminums on the left, two on the right. I've got six bromines on the left and six bromines on the right. Okay, so let's look at our next example. So we have magnesium plus chromium gives us magnesium plus chromium. <laughs> okay, so first thing, let's assign oxidation numbers. Okay, solid magnesium. Magnesium is a metal. Metal solids get zeros. Chromium on the right. Chromium solid, that's a solid metal, also gets a zero. Then our ions, monatomic ions, their atomic oxidation state is their charge. So a plus three and a plus two. Okay, so let's figure out who's oxidized and who's reduced. So the magnesium goes from a 0 to a plus 2, that's an oxidation. And our chromium, I'm going to cross my, cross my lines here, chromium goes from a 3 plus to a 0, that's a reduction. Okay, so I'm going to pull those pieces, my oxidation pieces and my reduction pieces, straight down vertically, because it's easy to see that way. And it's helpful to keep your oxidation numbers in there, just so you can see what the change is. And then my other, so this is my oxidation, and my other one is the chromium. And that's a plus 3 and a 0. Right? So, looks like we're going to have about the same scenario that we did in the previous problem. Um, so in my oxidation half reaction, I go from a 0 to a 2. That's a change of 2. That means 2 electrons have moved. And I'm going to put them on the side with the more positive oxidation state. Okay, in my re reduction half reaction with the chromium, go from a plus 3 to a 0. That's a change of 3. So I have 3 electrons have moved. So I'm going to put them on the side with the more a positive oxidation state. Okay, so again, I need my electrons to balance out. I need to be able to cancel those out. So I'm going to multiply, just like I did in the previous problem, to get a common multiple. Okay, my common multiple is 6. So I need the electrons to cancel out. So let's rewrite our equations just below so we can see. And we 
have three, excuse me, six electrons plus two chromium three plus, and we get two chromium solids. All right, we're gonna combine everything. Our electrons will cancel out because they're the same on both sides, on opposite sides of the equation, right? So 6e will go away. And then once I've combined every, or canceled out everything that's the same on both sides, all I have to do is drop down what's left. So let's see how we did. All right, let's write the two, write two balanced half reactions to describe this reaction. So we need to assign always when we're dealing with half reactions, Sign oxidation numbers. That's step one. Okay, so we have cobalt is a solid metal, so it gets a zero. And then on the right, we have silver solid, that gets a zero. Those are the easy ones to pick out. Okay, so on the left-hand side, so this should be, there should be an arrow in the middle here. On the left-hand side, we have silver nitrate, so two silver nitrate. So the nitrate will equal a, that whole piece will equal a minus one. So that means my silver is going to be a plus one, All right? And on the right-hand side, cobalt nitrate, each of those nitrates will be a minus one, so I get two of them. That means that my cobalt has to be a plus two. Okay, so polyatomic ions are really handy because the oxidation state of the whole ion is the same as its charge. Okay, so nitrate ions are minus one. Remember, if you haven't looked back at your polyatomics in a while, you might want to revisit those uh, before the final. Just a little warning, okay? Um, but let's take a look at what oxidation numbers have changed. Now, the, the nitrates have not changed, right? So I'm going to leave them out of my half reactions, right? So my cobalt has gone from a 0 to a plus 2. So that oxidation number has gone up. So that's an oxidation. And my silver has gone from a plus one to a zero. So that oxidation number went down, so it's reduced. Okay, so the easy way to do this is to just pull things straight down. So I've got cobalt solid makes cobalt two plus. Okay, so it's the same thing as just eliminating those nitrate ions out of there, okay? And then my other half reaction is 2Ag plus, because that's what the Ag would be without that nitrate ion, makes 2Ag solid. Okay, now taking a look at that silver part, we may or may not need to eliminate those twos because they're the same on both sides, okay? I'm thinking that we will. So let's go ahead and take those twos out because we want our lowest multiples, okay? So I find it's convenient to keep my oxidation numbers. So I've got a zero and a plus two and a plus one and a zero. So looking at my cobalt oxidation, I have a change of two. So that means two electrons have moved. 
So the cobalt went from a zero to a plus two. That's a change of two, two electrons. And I'm gonna put those on the side with the more positive oxidation state. And looking at my reduction, which is the silver reaction. So I have a change from plus one to a zero. So one electron has moved. So I'm gonna put that on the side of the more positive oxidation state. Okay, and those are our two half reactions. And this one kept the twos in there, which was well necessary to, to balance the equation completely, but the individual half reactions should be a one. So let's write a balanced re equation showing the reaction of zinc metal with chromium 3 nitrate. So hopefully your nomenclature is up to par and you know exactly what how to come up with the equation or the formula for chromium 3 nitrate. So we have zinc metal plus chromium 3 nitrate. So we're gonna, what's gonna happen is a single displacement reaction. So we'll end up with zinc nitrate. And zinc makes a two plus ion and some chromium metal. All right, single displacement reaction. All right, so we need to balance this guy. So on the left, we have one zinc, we have one chromium and nitrates we have three and on the right we have one zinc one chromium and nitrates we have two okay. so in order to make this work we need to find a common multiple right so the only things that are different are the nitrates so if my common multiple between three and two is six, if I put a two, let's change colors here so you can see. So if I put a two in front of that one, then that gives me six nitrates and two chromiums. And if I put a three in front of the other one, then that takes care of my nitrates and gives me three zincs. Okay. And then my solo metals, those are easy to balance. So zincs, I have one on the left, three on the right. If I put a three here, that makes three and three. And my chromiums, if I have two on the left, one on the right, I'm going to put a two here, and that balances those. So what technique is used to coat a thin metal surface onto another metal. So it's, we haven't spent much time on this, really any time on this, but fuel cells are sort of like batteries, so not really useful. Carbon sequestration, that's converting CO2 into um, solid carbon. It's not really doing what we are asked to be do, asked for. Appellative of, oh, <laughs> I didn't write this slide. We're gonna take that out. Um, and electrolysis, now electrolysis is technically used to do this thing, but what we're looking for is electroplating. So coating a metal with another metal is a process called electroplating. So anything that you have in your life that is chrome plated or nickel plated, copper plated, um, it's an electrochemical process. 